Shalom. Shalom. I thought I'd start the evening with Shalom because that's actually my first topic for the night. We're going to talk about health and sickness in the Old Testament. And in my research, I discovered that the primary term for health in the Old Testament is Shalom. This rather surprised me because I thought it meant have a nice day, but I guess that's not the case. <coughs> the Hebrew word which expresses the quality of the fullness and well-being of life is shalom. The word occurs about 250 times in the Old Testament. The root of the verb shalom is totality or completeness. This explains why it's often translated peace, because it's often used in narrower ways, like harmonious relationships between nations. Peace, or harmonious relationships between individuals, could be called peace. It's also appropriately translated prosperity in certain contexts in the Old Testament. <clears throat> and for that reason, there can even be references to the shalom of the wicked because the wicked prosper temporarily. But there is no real shalom for the wicked because to experience fullness of life, you need a right relationship with God. God is the source of shalom, according to the Old Testament. In Exodus 15, 26, he says, I am the Lord who heals you. Number six has that famous, um, it's called the Aaronic blessing, the blessing of Aaron. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you shalom. That last line actually should be translated, the Lord turn his face to you. So God is the source of this total well-being, which is what he intends for us. In Judges 6, Gideon, one of the judges, makes an altar at Ophrah, not to be confused with Winfrey, <laughs> and he called it, the Lord is Shalom, Yahweh Shalom. The context for this concept of health as total well-being is the assumptions that are common to all aspects of Judeo-Christian religion. There are assumptions about God, namely that he is one and he's the only true one. His power is sufficient to carry out his will and to engage in the activities of maintaining his creation. His moral character is that of holiness and righteousness and love. And he desires the well-being of all his creation. The assumption about humans, which forms part of the context for this idea of shalom as well-being, is that we are created in God's image and therefore that we have intellect and free will. And the assumption about the relationship between God and humans, which is a part of this context within which shalom is well-being, is the idea that God has created us for fellowship with him. He's interested in all our doings. We find our highest fulfillment and well-being in a close and continuing fellowship with God. We are the objects of God's love to whom he has revealed himself. And we are the subject of his redemption when we rebel against him. These are all assumptions. These are givens in Jewish and Christian religious thinking. And they form the background for this idea of God as the source of shalom. So what would the fullness of well 
well-being include? Well, it's, if it includes these assumptions that we just said about God, about man, about our relationship with God, then it's going to have to include righteousness. If we're to have a right relationship with God, we need to be upright. It will include obedience. We will be amenable to God's will. And it will also include physical wholeness and fullness of well-being. It will include strength. It will include fertility. It will include longevity. These are all aspects of what is meant by that word shalom in the Old Testament. Now what about the New Testament? term does it use when it wants to refer to health? Well, there is a single word in the New Testament that is most frequently used for health, and which is rather similar to the use of the word shalom in the Old Testament, and that's the Greek word sozo, S-O-Z-O. Sozo is normally translated to save. It's a verb, to save. The problem with that translation, though, is that after 2,000 years of church history, the term has come to refer primarily to the salvation of souls, kind of to the neglect of bodies. <coughs> but if you look at its use in the New Testament, you'll find it's reflective of the use of shalom in the Old Testament. And it refers not just to salvation of the soul, but fullness. I came to give life and to give it abundantly. So it includes healing of the body. When a healing occurs, the verb is usually so so. It includes exorcisms. When exorcisms <coughs> occur in the New Testament, the term that's used is so so. And it includes resuscitations or raising back to life. These are all examples of the restoration of human beings, <coughs> that fullness of being, which we call health, and which is meant by the word so <coughs> Now, what are the methods of healing that one finds in the Bible? I can find three different ways in which healing <coughs> are done. There's some preventive healing, if we want to call that a method, that's my favorite. Uh, better not to get sick in the first place. Let's prevent illness. And some of the um, 613 laws found in the Mosaic Law, in the first five books of the Bible, seem to have preventive health as their intention. But in addition to that, more centrally, there is natural healing and there is supernatural healing. The natural healing sometimes takes the form simply of the body. We have within us an ability to heal. It's built into us. That is referred to in the Old Testament. Also, folk medicine. You sometimes find references to it. You even find references to professional doctors. Not many, not often, but they are there occasionally. Supernatural healing, of course, involves the concept of miracle. So now let's take a look at some texts from the Old Testament that refer to healing. Here's an example of folk medicine from the book of Tobit. It's a long passage. I don't want to spend a long time reading it, so I'm going to summarize it for you. In the book of Tobit, there's an older gentleman whose name is Tobit. The book's named after him. Um, he has a son whose name is Tobias. And Tobit is out taking a nap.
happen in his backyard one afternoon when, unbeknownst to him, a sparrow has lighted on the tree branch above him. And when he looks up, the droppings fall into his eyes. And he gets up, and lo and behold, there are white, uh, I don't want to say con cataract, yeah, cataract on his eyes. So he's no longer able to work. He needs money. He had given some money in deposit to a friend of his in a different city. So he sends his grown son, young man, Tobias, off to this city to pick up the money for him. Now, as Tobias leaves, another, a guy comes up to him and says, where are you headed? Hey, I'm going there too. He, Tobias doesn't know it, but this is actually the angel Raphael, who has been sent by God because Toba had prayed that his sight be restored, and it's going to happen through the angel's agency. The two travel on to the next city. They get there. Lo and behold, this friend, relative of his dad, has a daughter who's the same age as Tobias, rather nice looking. He's got the right of uh, levirate marriage with her. There's only one problem, and that is she's already been married seven times, and every time a demon named Asmodeus kills the husband before they can consummate the marriage. Raphael says, go catch a fish, take out the liver, the heart, and the gallbladder, and go ahead and get married. I'll show you what to do. So he gets married. Raphael says, take the heart and the, I think it's the heart and the liver, and burn them in your marriage chamber before you go to bed. Tobias does this. Asmodeus cannot stand this horrible stink. So he sits <laughs> off to Egypt. Raphael chases right behind him and grabs him and binds him. So there's a cure. There's a healing. <laughs> it's a folk medical cure. It turns out that fish guts are good for humans. <laughs> he returns with his wife to his own home. Tobit comes stumbling out the doorway to embrace him. Raphael says, make a paste with the gallbladder and put it on his eyes. Tobias does that. It smarts, it burns, but then he's able to peel off the white cataracts and Tobit can see God's sunlight again. So I bring that as an instance of folk healing from the Old Testament. In addition to folk healing, there's refer another reference to natural cures, which is uh, physicians or doctors. Here's a passage from Sirach, chapter 38. Honor physicians for their services, for the Lord created them. For their gift of healing comes from the Most High, and they are rewarded by the King. The skill of physicians makes them distinguished, and in the presence of the great they are admired. The Lord created medicines out of the earth, and the sensible will not despise them. And he gave skill to human beings that he might be glorified in their marvelous works. By them, the physician heals and takes away pain. The pharmacist makes a mixture from them. God's works will never be finished. And from him, health spreads over all the earth. There's Shalom. In addition to natural healing in the Old Testament, there's also references to supernatural healings, to miracles. I uh, got hold of a book that's entitled All the Miracles of the Bible. And it, it's an attempt to list every miracle and every possible passage throughout the Bible, written by Herbert Lockyer. Um, I, he came up with a total of 138 miracles in the Old Testament. Some of them, I think, are a little iffy. So it's awfully hard to say exactly for sure, precise number. But that's not really of much interest to us, because most of those are nature miracles, and therefore not really relevant to our topic, which is healings. Most of them are nature miracles like 
the ten plagues, those are God and, uh, intervening in nature, um, splitting of the Red Sea, those sorts of things. I did, however, go through and find a total of 14 healings in the Old Testament. Let me just go through the list, and I'll pause a couple times and read a couple of these for you. The first one I found was Sarah's conception. Remember, she was barren. <coughs> That's a miracle. Moses' leprous hand. The Lord said to Moses, put your hand inside your cloak. He put his hand into his cloak, and when he took it out, his hand was leprous, as white as snow. Then God said, put your hand back into your cloak. So he put his hand back into his cloak, and when he took it out, it was restored like the rest of his body. That restoration was done by God. That's a miraculous cure. Miriam's leprosy. Miriam had the effrontery to question Moses, and as a result, she winds up with leprosy, but the healing is done by God as well. The birth of Samuel in 1 Samuel chapter 1 is um, very similar to the situation with Sarah. It's uh, a case of barrenness where a prayer is made and God answers the prayer. <coughs> the Philistines' tumors you might not be that familiar with. The hand of the Lord was heavy upon the people of Ashdod, and he terrified and struck them with tumors both in Ashdod and in its territory. And when the inhabitants of Ashdod saw how things were, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us. They had captured it recently in a, in a uh, battle. For his hand is heavy on us and on our God, Dagon. So they sent the ark of the God of Israel <coughs> to Ekron, another city of the Philistines. You sort of get the idea they didn't tell them ahead of time. <laughs> But when the ark of God came to Ekron, the people of Ekron cried out, Why have they brought around to us the ark of the God of Israel to kill us and our people? They sent therefore and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines and said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel and let it return to its own place, that it may not kill us and our people. There's a famine that occurs under David. And the cessation of the famine and the willingness to hear the pleas of Israel afterward are an instance of healing. After that, God heeded the supplications from the land. There's a plague under David. Kind of interesting because it refers to an angel. The Lord sent a pestilence on Israel from that morning until the appointed time. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem, the Lord relented concerning the evil, and said to the angel who was bringing destruction among the people, it is enough, stay your hand. Jeroboam has his hand withered. A prophet spoke against him. Jeroboam pointed at the prophet and said, nab that guy, and his hand withered as a result. So then he says to the prophet, uh, excuse me, sir, would you mind praying to God? <laughs> and so it goes away. This is 1 Kings chapter 13. Elijah resuscitates the son of a widow that she's staying with. He does this by stretching out on the body of the boy. Um, Elisha causes a barren woman to have a child. <laughs> She also resuscitates the boy when he dies later. She, he, uh, Elisha heals the leprosy of a Gentile named Naaman. All of these healings can be found in 2 Kings chapters 2 to 5. There's an interesting story in 2 Kings 13. Elisha died and they buried him. Now bands of Moabites, non-Israelites, used to invade the land in the spring of the year. As an Israelite man was being buried, a marauding band of these Moabites was seen, and the man was quickly thrown into the grave of Elisha. As soon as the man touched the bones of Elisha, he came to life and stood on his feet. It 
is a resuscitation through the instrumentality of bone. Lastly, among the 14 miracles of healing is Hezekiah's boil. Um, he's just sick with a, uh, a large boil. There's uh, natural healing here because we're told Isaiah said to him, bring a lump of figs, then take them and apply it to the boil as a fullness, so that he may recover. I believe it's on his neck. You can notice in these Old Testament miracles a couple of assumptions that exist in the Old Testament concerning healing, which I think we ought to be aware of. One of them is that sickness is a punishment for sin. That's a fairly common theme as you look at these miracles of healing in the Old Testament. You can find this in various passages that we haven't mentioned. For example, Psalm 38.3. There is no soundness in my flesh because of your indignation. Speaking to God. There is no shalom in my bones because of my sin. The assumption was if, you, if you're enduring sickness, then you must have sinned. Think of the book of Job, how the three friends came to him and said, you're covered with boils. That means you've done something, whether you're admitting it or not, when of course he hadn't. And in fact, um, the New Testament has a correction to this Old Testament idea. In Luke 13, verses 1 to 5, at that very time, there were some present who told Jesus about some Galileans whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. Jesus asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you. Or those 18 who were killed when a tower in Siloam fell on them. Do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you. But unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Here we see Jesus saying it's not necessarily so that there is a one-on-one -on -one equal sign correlation between sickness and sin. The second assumption that one can see in these Old Testament passages that we need to beware of is the idea that God is the source of both good and evil. I think you've heard that several times as I was going through those. Um, for example, in Exodus chapter 4, verse 11, God says to Moses, Who gives speech to mortals? Who makes them mute or deaf, seeing or blind? Is it not I, the Lord? Exodus 4, 11. Job himself, when he first receives the boils, says, shall we receive the good at the hand of God and not receive the bad? The assumption is everything that happens is intended in just that way by God. Again, we have a correction of that idea in the New Testament. Matthew, Matthew chapter 5, verses 44 and 45, which is part of the Sermon on the Mount, has Jesus say, love your enemies. Why? So that you may be children of your Father in heaven. So that you, you'll be like him, you'll imitate him, because he loves his enemies. He makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And he sends rain on the righteous and on the unrighteous. 1 John chapter 1, verse 5, God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. So, we take the standard procedure of Catholic interpretation that the Old Testament must be interpreted in light of the New, and that there is progression of understanding until you come to the fullness of Revelation with Jesus.
Let's turn to the New Testament. There are three terms that are used for healing in the Gospels in reference to Jesus' miracles. One of them is teras, T-E-R-A-S. That's a Greek word which means wonder. So his miracles are called wonders. Why would they be called that? Because of the response that people had when they saw his miracles. That's a kind of a minimal information about what miracles are. If we add to it a second term, which is dynamis, we get our word dynamic or dynamo from that. Dynamis means power. And Jesus' miracles are frequently referred to as deeds of power. For example, one day while he was teaching, the power of the Lord was with him to heal. That's Luke 5.17. Um, Mark 6, chapter 2. Many who heard him were astounded. They said, what deeds of power are being done by his hand? And there's other references. Deeds of power is a term for miracles. What that adds to the term Torah is who's doing them? It's God's power. The power that is manifested in Jesus' miracles is God's power. For example, and yet in the Annunciation, Luke chapter 1, Gabriel says to Mary, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Luke 4.14, 4, after Jesus starts, grows up and starts his public ministry, then Jesus, filled with the power of the Spirit, returned to Galilee. Luke 24.49, he's ready to ascend. After the resurrection, he says to the apostles, I am sending upon you what my father promised, so stay here in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. So it's God's power that is causing the works. The third term is semeon. That's where we get words like uh, semiotics and so on. It means sign. And it seems to me that ad that adds yet a third dimension to our concept of miracles. They're not just wonders, they're not just power, supernatural power, but they tell us the purpose of the miracles. They are intended to be signs. They're intended to speak to our intellects and to cause us to make a judgment. Do I accept what this miracle says to me, which is, um, substantiating Jesus' mission. And if I accept that these are signs that Jesus is who he says he is, and that I should listen to everything he says, then I am obligated to convert. <coughs> there is a fourth term, ergon, which means work, but a work simply sums up those other three characteristics. Okay, now you have a handout with you this evening. I went through the Gospels and uh, found all the miracles I could. <clears throat> I think I got it right. What I found was 49 accounts of miracles done by Jesus. But you come up with 49 if you go from the start of Matthew to the end of John. And a lot of those are duplicates, you know, because Matthew, Mark, and Luke tell a lot of the same miracles. So if you eliminate the duplicates or the doublets, what you wind up with is 26. So there are 26 healings of individuals that Jesus engaged in during his public ministry. Here's, here's the list on the left of your chart. The Capernaum demoniac is the earliest miracle reported in Mark. Just to give you a quick um, refresher, I'll read these first couple. They went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. 
They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent, and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The second on our list is Peter's mother-in-law. When Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying in bed with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her, and she got up and began to serve them. <coughs> I've always found it interesting that the first pope had a mother-in-law. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> <laughs> of course, it's argued that before he began his public ministry after Jesus' death, his wife might have died. I'm not getting into that. <laughs> what else do we have? Just to refresh your memory here on some other miracles. The leper, the paralytic, the man with a withered hand, the centurion's servant. That's the only one that occurs only in Matthew and Luke. It's so cute. The widow of Nine's son. A miracle that occurs only in Luke. The Gerasene demoniac. When you look at that spot in Matthew, it turns out he has two demoniacs, and he refers to the territory as Gadarene rather than Gerasene. Jairus' daughter <coughs> is a resuscitation. The woman with a flow of blood. Two blind men, only in Matthew. The Syrophoenician girl, she's a Gentile. That's an exorcism. The deaf mute, the blind man of Bethsaida. I, that's a, uh, both of those are the, I think they're the only two miracles that occur only in art. The epileptic boy, the mute demoniac, the bent woman, a man with dropsy, swelling of the ankles, I suspect. Uh, ten lepers. Blind Bartimaeus, the high priest slave's ear, Mary Magdalene, an exorcism. Not narrated like all the rest of these, but there's a reference to Jesus having expelled seven demons. The nobleman's son, the paralytic at Bethesda, the man born blind, and the raising of Lazarus. Then those are the 26 healings of individuals that one finds in the New Testament. Of those, as it says at the top of your first page, of those 26 unique healings of individuals, 17 are physical healings, six of them are exorcism, and three of them are resuscitations or raising the dead. In addition to these 26 healings of individuals, of which we have knowledge from the Gospels, there are also summary passages where we're told he did a lot of healings in such and such a time. And if you go through the Gospels, you'll find, this is your third page, 13 summary healings of groups. And on this page, passages that mention exorcisms as well as physical healings, I put an asterisk next to I'm following uh, John Wilkinson in his excellent book, uh, he Healing in the Bible. And parallel passages that don't mention healings, but say he was in such and such a town teaching, get square brackets. So if you add the 26 and the 13, you might have a total of 39 accounts in the New Testament of Jesus' healing. Just to refresh your memory, what we mean by these summary passages, I'll read you one or two. <coughs> the first one at Capernaum. That evening, 
they brought to him many who were possessed of demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and cured all who were sick. This was to fulfill what had been spoken to the prophet Isaiah. He took our infirmities and bore our diseases. The third one, by the Sea of Galilee, is that your third one? Okay. He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the town were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Now that's a kind of an interesting thing, this idea that you can just touch Jesus and that will heal you. If you go back to the front page, you'll notice I have a column here. Besides the names of the miracles and where you can find them, and the types, either physical healing or exorcism or resuscitation, I've included a column called disease, which gives you what doctors nowadays think, given the symptoms that are described, the illness might have been. Those, those are to lesser or greater degrees speculative, but interesting. Initiator tells us who was it who came to Jesus and asked for this healing. Oftentimes, it's the sick person. Uh, blind Bartimaeus called out from the side of the road to be healed. Sometimes the disciples bring somebody, like Peter's mother-in-law. Sometimes it's the friend of a sick person, like the paralytic's friend, brought him and lowered him through the roof. Sometimes it's a relative, like Jairus uh, asked Jesus to heal his daughter, or the mother of the Syrophoenician woman, and so on. The next column tells you who saw it. And generally speaking, your choices are a crowd, <coughs> disciples, Pharisees. Motive. A lot of times no motive is mentioned as to why Jesus acquiesces in the, in the request for a healing. But when there is a reference, I tried to put it down here, he healed the leper because he felt compassion for him. He healed the paralytic because he said, do you have faith? The paralytic said yes. And he was healed. Um, the two blind men cry for mercy. He responds. Manifesting glory is a motive that one finds in John's gospel. And then lastly is method. That's what caused me to remember to talk about these columns, because method includes this idea of just touching Jesus. Look at the different methods here. All, a lot of these are commands, especially the exorcisms. I think almost without exception, the exorcisms are a command, come out of him, or cease, whatever. Uh, but there's a fair number with touch involved. I added them up. What did I come up with? Uh, 16 out of the 39, if you add the individual and the summaries together, you get 39. 16 out of the 39 are commands. So what is that? About a third? Between a third and a half? 14 involve touch. So it's about the same. These are the two ways in which Jesus healed. And sometimes they're combined, as you can see in that column on method. Of a special interest in method is the laying on of hands. That occurs four times. Specifically said, he laid his hands on the person and healed them. Other times, he touches the uh, his tempered part and heals it. Uh, he touches a hand, or he touches the eyes, or he touches the ear that had been cut off of the high priest servant. There's three healings that involve saliva. Those are listed there in that column. But never in an exorcism does Jesus touch the person. It's always a command. 
Okay, so now that gives us a general idea of the scope of healings in the Gospels. What about Acts? If you go to the next page. Oh, wait a minute, I forgot. I decided to be complete on Jesus' miracles, even though the Nietzsche miracles aren't really relevant to healing. But just for your curiosity, if you want all the miracles Jesus did, then add these other seven here on the next page. Turning water into wine, the miraculous catch of fish, which appears in Luke 5 and in John 21, stilling the storm, feeding the 5,000, walking on water, feeding the 4,000, the coin in the fish's mouth, and cursing the fig tree. You'll notice, by the way, that the only miracle of all the healings and the nature miracles, the only miracle that's in all four Gospels is multiplication of the loaves and the fishes, the feeding of the 5,000, which has Eucharistic implications. So if you add the seven nature miracles, that's a misprint, it should be 39. There are 39 accounts of Jesus in the Gospel. Let's blame that on my secretary, shall I? <laughs> As if I had one. <laughs> but if you add the 39 healing miracles and the seven nature miracles, you wind up with a total of 46, it should say. And then there's other incidental references to miracles. All right, let's move on to the Acts of the Apostle, because it wasn't just Jesus in the New Testament who healed, it was also the Apostles. There I was able to come across eight instances of healings of individuals. So in this chart, I had to add a new column, and that says who did it. So the third column tells who the healer is. There's a lame man at the temple gate. Peter heals him. Paul is blind after the road to Damascus conversion experience, and Ananias heals him. Aeneas, a paralytic, gets healed by Peter. Tabitha, a woman, also known as Dorcas, is healed by Peter, or excuse me, resuscitated by Peter. Paul heals a cripple at Lystra. <coughs> Paul heals a Philippian slave girl. Excuse me, that's an exorcism. It's kind of a funny passage, really. This uh, Philippian slave girl <coughs> keeps following him around, calling out, he's the servant of God, he's the servant of God. And finally, Paul gets, it, it literally says, he got so annoyed that he exercised. <laughs> Eutychus at Troas is resuscitated. And Publius' father has a healing. Again, I give you the speculations of present-day doctors. This Publius' father may have had vasillary dysentery. Who initiated it? Who witnessed it? The motives, there's annoyance, <laughs> and the method. Again, I'm curious about the method because you got touch and command, touch and command, prayer and command, touch. Eutychus is interesting. Here's a case, this is Acts chapter 20, where Paul has gone to Ephesus. He's about to leave Ephesus. They have mass that evening, and then afterward, Paul starts giving a sermon, basically, to a room full of people. Well, there's a young guy sitting in the window, probably hoping to keep cool. The porches, the sweat, the heat from all the bodies, plus Paul's long-windedness, causes the guy in the window, Eutychus, to drop off to sleep, which causes him to drop out the window. They happen to be on the third floor. <laughs> he dies. Paul runs downstairs, embraces him. Do you remember Elijah in the Old Testament? He had full body contact. It's the same kind of uh, situation here. And Eutychus revives. There's four summary healings of groups in Acts. 
Now, here's a really interesting one. Acts 5, 15 to 16, says that early Christians would lay their sick on the sidewalk in hopes that if Peter came by, his shadow would at least land on them. That's interesting because it shows us the reverence with which Peter was held in the early church, and rightly so, but it also has implications, I think, for um, reverence. The idea that inanimate things can be instruments through which God heals. I've made a collection of these as I was doing my research. Elijah's mantle is used to do a miracle. He rolls up his mantle and slaps the Jordan and it puts, uh, The bones of Elijah, we already came across, that had importance for the doctrine of relics. The hymn of Christ's garments, there's three times that there's reference made to people trying to touch the hem of Christ's garment. There's the woman with the flow of blood, there's a summary healing in Mark, and there's a summary healing in Luke, where we're told people try to touch him. Um, Peter's shadow, they even carried out the sick into the streets and laid them on cots and mats in order that Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he came by. And lastly, there's a reference in Acts 19 to Paul's clothing. God did extraordinary miracles through Paul, so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them, and the evil spirits came out of them. One commentary I looked at said that these two items of clothing, the translation I have says handkerchiefs or aprons, said that it's probably his work clothes and it means a headband to hold the sweat and a work apron to protect his clothes. Okay, so we've been talking a lot about these miracles in the Old Testament and in the New, and we've been talking a lot about these exorcisms in the Old Testament and in the New. Are we obliged to believe these things? Is it part of our faith that we believe that these miracles actually happen, that miracles actually happen, and that exorcism happen? My answer is yes. We are obliged to believe these things. Uh, Catholicism is not fundamentalist in its approach to the scriptures. We don't necessarily say that every single miracle happened exactly the way it's described, and it may even be the case that some of the miracles didn't happen. For example, when Matthew has two garrison demoniacs and everybody else has one. So we're, we're not picky about the details. Here's what uh, the Pontifical Biblical Commission said about fundamentalism. Fundamentalist interpretation starts from the principle that the Bible, being the word of God, inspired and free from error, should be read and interpreted literally in all its details. But that ignores historical origins and development. Fundamentalism also places undue stress upon details concerning historical events or supposedly scientific truth. <coughs> Fundamentalism actually invites people to a kind of intellectual suicide. It injects into life a false certitude, for it unwittingly confuses the divine substance of the biblical message with what are, in fact, its human limitations. So I'm not going to argue for every single detail of every miracle, but I would argue that Jesus did miracles. That, I think, is a definite part of our faith. The primary objections that have been made to miracles have mostly arisen within the last 300 years. And they really got going with the Enlightenment or European rationalism in philosophy. So one of the objections is to the belief in miracles 
Uh, these, these healings, they were just natural events, and the people who saw them or the people who repeated them added details to puff them up and make them more spectacular. Uh, some scripture scholars have tried to say these are natural events. How could it be then that they were misinterpreted as miracles? And so they come up with things like, well, Lazarus wasn't really dead, he was in a coma. Or uh, Jesus didn't really walk on water. There were stones just below the surface and he was walking on those and nobody realized what was really happening. It, it, it's really rather absurd. We, if you actually try to figure out how it could be that some kind of natural occurrence could wind up being presented the way it is. I also think that this argument falls down because the miracles are integrally interwoven with everything about Jesus. This whole mission, the, the miracles are part of that. Let me read you a couple quotes. This is from a fellow named Driscoll who had an article on miracles in the Catholic Encyclopedia. The miracles of Christ have a doctrinal import. They have a vital connection with his teaching and mission. They illustrate the nature and purpose of his kingdom. And they show a connection with some of the greatest doctrines and principles of his church. In effect, what, what Jesus is saying by doing miracles and performing <coughs> exorcisms is, I am who I say I am. I am from God. I do have divine power. And the miracles that he's, in which he teaches God's mercy to sinners, miracles like the prodigal son, or the two sons, or the laborers in the vineyard, or the two debtors, or the great supper. Those parables are simply story form of what he's doing indeed when he does the miracles, because his miracles are showing God's mercy and graciousness. So the miracles are acted out parables in a way. And because they are exactly the same message as what Jesus <coughs> is saying, is teaching, it seems to me that to try to cut them off is to arbitrarily and artificially um, delimit the fullness of Christ's communication to us. Another objection that you sometimes hear to miracles is uh, it's called antecedent improbability. Hume, David Hume, the Scottish philosopher, came up with this one. He said, The laws of nature are so uniform and so um, consistent that it is always going to be the case that a natural event is the explanation rather than somebody saying that it was a miracle. See what he means? You understand that argument? The laws of nature are so tight and so firm that it can never be the case that the testimony of miracles, which is all we've got for Jesus' miracles, we don't have them anymore, they happened a long time ago, we have the testimony of them, can never be more probable. Well, I think this argument has a major problem. Let me read you another quotation from Driscoll. Human will, in acting on material forces, interferes with the regular sequences of natural forces. But the human will does not paralyze the natural forces or destroy their innate tendency to act in a uniform manner. Thus, for example, a boy by throwing a stone in the air, does not disarrange the order of nature or do away with the law of gravity. A new force only is brought in and counteracts the tendencies of natural forces, just as the natural forces interact and counteract among themselves. 
This happens every day. All of us are interfering in the natural forces of nature. Well, if we can interfere in the laws of nature and it's no big deal, why is it such a big deal if God does? God also has a will. God also can choose to interject himself into the forces of nature. And those forces will continue doing what they do. They'll just make room. The same way that the air makes room for the stone being thrown. So I think that's the preferable way of looking at the laws of nature rather than this concept that the universe is a mechanism. And it's like clockwork. Nothing can possibly be altered or changed. In fact, it's much freer than that. <coughs> the underlying assumption of all these objections is this idea of absolute uniformity of nature. And that idea really presupposes either that God does not exist or that God never touches creation after having created it. In the one case, you've got atheism. In the other case, you've got theism. Theism was that idea, kind of faddish in the 1700s, that God wound up the universe like a clock, set it over here, and it's been unwinding ever since. If that's the underlying assumption, and if, if that's what's causing people to be unable to allow for miracles, then really they need to rethink whether God exists or not. I think God exists because creation exists. I think God exists because I'm in direct contact with an immaterial reality, namely me, my consciousness, my interior. So it seems to me um, highly probable that there is more to the universe than just materiality and also that God exists. Well, another objection gets raised, not just to miracles, but to exorcisms. Even people who will allow exorcisms, a lot of, or excuse me, allow miracles, a lot of them will say, this idea about demons and all that, this is a first century Palestinian Jewish thinking, and doesn't really hold. But Jesus is awfully firm about it, not only in the exorcisms we've seen, but in his references to the devil. In John 12, 31, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. John 14, 30, the ruler of this world is coming. Paul is even more brash. He calls the devil the god of this world. That's in 2 Corinthians 4, 4. And Jesus affirms Satan's power, not just his existence, but his power over us. He says to the disciples, Luke 10, 19, See, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. Luke 22, 53, When I was with you day after day in the temple, you did not lay hands on me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. So, the church has always affirmed that there are indeed evil spirits. It explains them in terms of fallen angels. That's scriptural. 2 Peter 2, 4 and 9 say, For if God did not spare the angels when they sinned, but cast them into hell and committed them to chains of deepest darkness to be kept until the judgment, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from trial. Jude 6 says, And the angels who did not keep their own position but left their proper dwelling, he has kept in eternal chains and deepest darkness to the judgment of the great day. The Sacred Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith put out a document in 1975 entitled Christian Faith and Demonology 
And here's a couple of excerpts from it. Some assert that scripture does not permit an affirmation to be made either for or against the existence of Satan and the demons. Others say that the New Testament affirmation of demons <coughs> reflects the ideas of Jewish writings or is dependent on New Testament, New Testament traditions, but not on Christ. For such persons, Satan and the demons are only mythical or functional personifications, the significance of which is solely to underline in a dramatic fashion the hold which evil and sin have on mankind. But given all the scriptural references to demons, especially those references by Jesus, there is a necessary conclusion. Satan, whom Jesus had confronted by his exorcisms, which he had encountered in the desert and in his passion, cannot be simply the product of the human faculty of inventing fables and personifying ideas, nor can he be an erroneous relic of a primitive cultural language. John Paul II, in 1986, in one of his general audiences, reaffirmed this doctrine, this teaching. He said, when by an act of his own free will, Satan rejected the truth that he knew about God, he became the cosmic liar and father of lies. That's quoting John 8.44. For this reason, he lives in radical and irreversible denial of God and seeks to impose on creation, on the other beings created in the image of God, and in particular on people, his own tragic lie about God. To finish off this little digression as to whether we should believe in miracles and in exorcisms, I thought I'd mention some recent miracles because I find these uh, quite helpful to my faith. Uh, to realize that miracles did not just happen back then in this storybook of the gospel, but they actually happened then and they're still happening now. Lourdes, here's what I found. You know, in 1858, Bernadette Subaru had 18 visions between February and July. From 1862 to 1965, 62 miracles have been recognized by the church as real miracles. And it's a tough process. Um, there's a preliminary documentation available to any doctor that wants to look at it. <coughs> Only the documentation regarding truly inter interesting cures is submitted to the International Medical Committee of Lourdes. Uh, if this committee decides that the cure is clinically inexplicable, then it's passed on to the Canonical Commission. Uh, very few cases finally reach the Ecclesiastical Tribunal. In 1947, the Lourdes Bureau recommended only six out of 75 potential <coughs> cure cases and of these, the International Committee accepted one. But of course, Lourdes aren't the only miracles that are going on right now. What about saints? You're all aware, probably, that to be a saint, you need to have a couple of miracles accredited to you through your intercession, part of the process. Here's what I found. From 1900 to 1970, the number of miracles, miraculous cures, that were recorded in the canonization processes of saints is 166. So, God is alive and well and living on planet Earth. Well, we've established that there was healing in the Old Testament times, in the New Testament times, how do we know that Jesus intended healing to continue within the church after his time? That's the crucial question. Can we show that not only did he heal, but somehow he transferred to his apostles and to the church as a whole the ability to heal? Not just the ability, not just the power, but the authority to heal. And I think we can. I think there's three passages in the New Testament. This is what I want to finish with tonight. I think there's three passages in the New Testament which show that Jesus intended healing to continue in the church. On 
My first proof is the commissions that Jesus gave to the apostles. Twice, Jesus gives mission commissions to a group of disciples. In one case, he gives it to the twelve. Uh, in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, we're told that to the twelve, he said, go out and preach and heal. Do not take with you a bag. Do not take sand, extra sandals, extra tunic. Only a purse. Only stay with one person. Shake the dust from your feet if they won't receive you, etc. You're all familiar with these passages, right? That's a commission for others to heal, namely the first bishops of the church, the apostles. So there, I think, is one indication that it was Jesus' intention that the power and authority of healing was not to be restricted to him, but is profuse in the church itself throughout history. Second is the charism of healing. And this is the last of your handouts. If you look on the back of the last page, you'll find a handout that refers to charisms of the Holy Spirit. Do you all have that? OK. Now, I went through and listed all of the passages where charisms are mentioned. These are called charisms. Uh, charis is Greek for gift, and usually translated grace. These are graces, but they're special gifts because you can tell from the context they're intended by God to be used by the recipient for the benefit of others. That's what constitutes a charism. It's not just a benefit for you, like sanctifying grace, but it's some gift given to you in order that you can help others. So what do you wind up with here? Here's the citations. Here's the full texts. But let's go to the lists. The first passage, Romans 12, gives us prophecy, ministry, teaching, exporting, giving, leadership, compassion, or cheerfulness. The second passage, 1 Corinthians 12, gives us wisdom, knowledge, faith, healing, miracles, prophecy, discernment of spirits, tongues, interpretation of tongues. Later in 1 Corinthians 12, you have another list which mentions apostles, prophets, teachers, deeds of power, healing, assistance, leadership, tongues. Even later in 1 Corinthians 12, you have the third list at that spot. Apostles, prophets, teachers, miracle workers, healing, tongues, interpretation of tongues. In Ephesians chapter 4, there's a brief list which mentions apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. And lastly, in 1 Peter chapter 4, you get a reference to speakers and to servers. You'll notice some of these gifts are offices, like apostle or like teacher. Sometimes, however, they're not offices, but functions, like prophecy. I would argue that the occurrence of healing more than once in these lists of charisms means that God is giving right now to some of us, to some of the members of the church, the gift of healing. And that he intends that to be used by us, or by them, for the benefit of the rest of us. Um, this, I think, is the foundation and justification for the charismatic renewal, insofar as it's using healing, uh, which officially began in 1974. Third and last, remember I said there were three scriptural reasons that can show that Jesus intended the healing to continue on in the church. The first was those commissions to the 12 and the 70. The second is this uh, inclusion of healing in the charisms. Third and last is James chapter 5. James chapter 5 verses... 14 and six, 14 to 16. Check this out. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. 
The prayer of faith will save the sick, and the Lord will raise them up, and anyone who has committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Now, this very important passage. It's in the context of prayer. He's, he's talking about prayer, and it's in that context that he brings up healing. So, prayer is mentioned in both of the ways that he here says healing can occur. One of the ways that he mentions seems to be somewhat similar to that charism thing, because in James chapter 14, he says, pray for one another. That's not necessarily the charism. I mean, you and I can pray for one another's health. So everybody's available to, to pray for health. That doesn't seem to be an, an official kind of healing ministry in the church. But the other type of healing that's referred to in this passage does seem to be institutional. Are any among you sick? They should call for the presbyters of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. That word presbyter, which means elder, the Greek is presbyteros, that's the word we get priest from. Presbyteros, presbyt, presbyt, priest. Short form. <laughs> so here we have the root of the sacrament of the anointing of the sick, which in fact is what this whole series is about, and I finally managed to, man managed to mention it in the last two minutes of my talk. <laughs> Thank you very much.